Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthias Duva. I'm head of the climate policy team at Ecologic Institute, a Berlin-based think tank on environmental policy. And I have the pleasure of moderating this EFEX webinar on the state of play on the green deals in the EU and the US. EFEX stands for Energy Future Exchange, and it's a joint project we're doing with our sister institute in the US and the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, ECEEE. The project's funded through the European Union's program on transatlantic civil society dialogue, and we're very grateful for their support. Through EFEX, we aim to create a dialogue and an exchange on a range of climate and energy policy issues. For example, through activities like this webinar series. Today's topics are the green deals being proposed on both sides of the Atlantic. A Green New Deal in the United States and a European Green Deal on this side of the big pond. In both cases, we understand them to provide a political vision of a climate neutral future that will also bring economic prosperity and greater social cohesion. And at the same time, at this uh, where we are right now, there are different levels of detail available yet on the specifics behind these larger concepts. And so they actually do mean different things to different people. So what we want to be doing with this webinar today is do a status check and get some of the fundamentals straight. And uh, with us today to tell us uh, about their work and their respective perspectives on the Green Deals on both sides of the Atlantic are two renowned experts. We have with us today Doug Sims, who is a senior advisor for green finance and director of NRDC's Green Finance Center, where he leads a team that provides analysis, advocacy, and thought leadership on innovative financing for low carbon and climate resilient infrastructure. NRDC, of course, is the Natural Resource Defense Council. It's a privately funded nonprofit environmental advocacy organization that's based in New York with offices around the US and in Beijing. And Doug is particularly well suited for um, uh, our webinar today because he's not only an, an infrastructure finance law by training, but he's really developed a strong record and track record in a range of sustainable finance related initiatives. He helped launch the New York Green Bank in the United States, and he's a co-founder of the Global Green Bank Network. Doug, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Matthias. And of course, uh, we have for the European expert with us today, Quentin Genard, who is currently serving as the acting head of uh, the Brussels office of E3G, which stands for Environmentalism Third Generation. And he leads E3G's work on the energy union governance, the EU's 2050 climate and energy strategy, and on energy efficiency. And E3G is an independent climate change think tank that's operating to accelerate the global transition to a low carbon economy with offices in London, Brussels, Berlin, and Washington, DC. So transatlantic connection right there in E3G as well. as well. In the past five years, he's been closely involved in monitoring the development and adoption of the EU's framework for the 2030 climate and energy policies, specifically the so-called clean energy package for all package. package of legislation. Thank you for joining us as well, Quentin. Thank you for having me. Uh, so a quick shout out to those that are watching live. You may ask questions while you're watching uh, via the chat. Uh, you can do that at any time during the webinar. Um, uh, but, and please note that a recording is being made of this broadcast, which will be available online a few days after our session today. Now, to get us started on the subject matter and actually hand over to our uh, experts, my first question goes to you, Doug, uh, because the US is, of course, where the notion of a Green New Deal, specifically, originally emerged and where it's it gained political prominence again in 2019. So to get us started, please give us a bit of essential background. Where does the term Green New Deal come from? What does it mean? And who are its proponents? Sure. Thanks, Matthias. Uh, I think we can go then to, to skip to the next slide. It will be a brief NRDC slide. And then I think you've already covered this. I'll just note that, um, 
you know, we, we, uh, we started in the U.S. Um, we have a broad range of experts, about 700 people worldwide, um, everyone from scientists to economists to um, folks working on legislation at the state, local, and federal, and global level, and also very involved in the global climate conversations. Uh, so next slide, please. So I'm going to start a little bit out of the order you described, Matthias, and talk about the people first, because that's really critical to understanding um, the why and the what and the how of the Green New Deal. So um, on the screen before you are is presidential candidate and Senator Bernie Sanders on the left and um, newly elected congressman from New York, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And um, the Green New Deal um, is a term which has been around um, since at least 2007. Its origin is in dispute. Um, there's a New York Times columnist named um, Thomas Friedman who did use it in an article in 2007 to refer to a package of essentially um, infrastructure investment reforms. And he, he claims it was taken up by Obama and his platform in 2008. I don't remember that, but, <laughs> but in any event, it didn't really catch on at the time. Um, and, and so recently, um, there's been uh, a youth-led movement called the Sunrise Movement. Um, which is essentially um, some ac climate activists um, with uh, a think tank in D.C. who um, we call her, uh, we call Ocasio-Cortez AOC, who AOC um, sort of has adopted as one of her main um, groups for putting out a climate message. And so um, AOC was successful in sort of toppling um, an incumbent in New York who's a very powerful Democrat, and she rode um, into Congress with um, a lot of attention, and she grabbed this Green New, Green New Deal as being one of her initial policy initiatives um, to, to, to put forward. So just to fast forward, so, um, well, she also identified herself as um, a democratic socialist, which was something which the only other member in Congress who um, defined himself that way was Bernie Sanders. So she aligned herself with the momentum that, that Bernie had started um, in the 2016 election, which was hotly contested unexpectedly um, from a, a left candidate like Bernie. And so in the last, uh, let's, let's call it 11 months since the Green New Deal was formally announced, um, Ocasio-Cortez um, has um, really become um, the leader of this. And Bernie Sanders in his presidential campaign has adopted it as part of his platform when he's driven the rest of the field to also adopt the platform and caused um, the rest of the field to react to this bold, this bold vision. So, um, and then the most, and then we'll get to this later, but most recently last week, um, the uh, Ocasio-Cortez, Bernie Sanders um, team announced the first legislative plank of the Green New Deal, which as we'll see in a second, um, is, has, is not a legislative program. It's essentially a set of principles and ideas that were advanced to get these ideas um, on, on the map. But the last thing I'll add about these people is that they, um, that, that Ocasio-Cortez is such a star now that she, her endorsement of Bernie Sanders um, was, was a huge boon. It seems being a huge boon to him a couple of weeks ago. Even though she's a freshman congressman, he's a very senior senator. So there's a lot of momentum on the left with these ideas, and these two people are really spearheading it. Um, before, before I move on, actually, I will just touch on, since we're on the people piece, there are obviously many people opposed to this idea, and those people um, are some who are essentially in the Democratic Party. Um, I, I think opposed maybe small o. <laughs> um, the leader of that is Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi is the most powerful Democrat um, in the country right now. She leads the House of Representatives, which is the um, House of Congress, which Ocasio-Cortez is a part of. And she um, has tried to sort of slow down um, the Green New Deal momentum on the grounds that it's not practical and that it exposes other members of her, of her coalition to um, easy criticisms from the right. Um, socialism, state control, all these things. Um, so she's been sort of slowing down, slowing down the momentum and um, not putting forward this detailed policy platform, this Congress that some wanted her to put forward. Of course, on the right, this has been seen as being a, ra a rallying cry for um, Republicans, cries of socialism, state control, bankrupting the government, job killing. Um, there's been 
some some real um, sort of ad hominem attacks, saying that she's calling for restricting flying in airplanes. She wants to stop all hamburgers and eliminate all cows and, and, and quote, quote unquote cow farts. So it's um it's been pretty extreme. But I will say that just 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 to, just to um, um, unfortunately some of this seems to seems to have taken hold because the messaging. There's some recent data out from the Yale program on climate communication. And if you look back to 2018, December, when this was announced, even 57% of conservative Republicans liked the name, the term Green New Deal. And when you explained to them what it was, they, just, they still liked it. And, and it's since the time of this concerted effort against um, the Green New Deal on Fox News in particular, um, that support has dropped to something from 57% of conservative Republicans to 32%. So it's had, it's had an impact, it's had an interesting point. So why don't we um, go, let's see if you have any questions now, Matthias, let me go to the next slide. Is it, okay, so um, going to the next slide, this is about the, the principles and we'll get to the policy later, but I wanted to show these side by side because they're important. So the Green New Deal as it, is, as it was announced um, in 2018 by Ocasio-Cortez was in the form of a non-binding resolution it was not in the form of legislation. And the idea was that the resolution would lay out some broad principles and be brought for a vote to the, on the floor of both houses of Congress to assert momentum and adherence to sort of Green New Deal principles. So um, even if it were passed by both houses of Congress, it would not constitute a legislative program. The idea with that, it would set out these principles and then you'd fill in the program um, over time with detailed legislation. A bold idea, um, which uh, initially had a lot of very positive momentum. There was some uh, botching of the rollout by Ocasio-Cortez's office. They released the wrong draft, <laughs> and that draft had some things which were even were viewed as being even more extreme to the left as the as the real Green New Deal, such as providing guaranteed income to people who don't want to work, which Republicans seized on. But nevertheless, it got out. It changed the conversation. So the fate of that resolution has been as follows. It actually was passed by the Democratic um, House of Representatives. And in the Senate, if you, and we're, what we're seeing on the screen here actually is the Senate version of this resolution. Um, and the handwritten um, names on that are the co-sponsors. And we'll say, we'll, we'll briefly say who those people are. But the Senate um, is controlled by the Republicans. And they um, wanted to, which, and so they can't, it was never expected that the Republicans would pass the resolution, um, but the leader of the, of the of the Senate decided to bring the vote to the floor to force Democrats to go on record as being in favor of an extreme communist idea. <laughs> so, so, uh, so we looked at the result of that vote. The Senate, the Senate has a hundred senators, and there's um, in 50, uh, 53 of those. 50, 50, 53 of those are Republican. Um, essentially, the vote was strangely 57 to zero, <laughs> opposing the Green New Deal. Now, what happened was um, the Democrats did not want to be caught on record voting for something that was set up, they thought. So all the Democratic um, senators, except for three, um, voted present, essentially abstained from voting, on uh, yay or nay. And there were some and the other ones who did vote in favor in favor of opposing it against it, in other words, um, were ones who were in vulnerable um, areas where they had a significant Republican base. So the resolution itself has passed one house, not passed the other, um, hasn't had a lot of impact on that level. So um, going to the what does the resolution say? Well, it's important. It quickly it frames the it frames the concepts in terms of two critical reports. One, of course, is the 2018 IPCC report, which um, says we must achieve 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2040. And this other interesting report that's US-based called the 2018 um, US um, Fourth National Climate Assessment, which came out in November 2018. This is a document which is produced by, uh, I think, like 18 different government agencies across the, across the US government. And it basically concluded that the U.S. economy was risk, had serious risks. Sorry, the U.S. In, on economic level, the level of public health and the environment faced tremendous risks from climate change. 
and, and the cost of those risks included 141 billion in heat-related deaths, um, 100 heat-related losses and, and deaths, 118 billion um, sea level rise, 32 billion in infrastructure damage. This is all through the end of of the century, um, and these these uh, events include fires, crop failures, crumbling infrastructure, declining crop crop yields. Um, supply chains being disrupted, and all this, this this data came out under the Trump administration, even though Trump had pulled out of Paris Agreement, even though Trump is eviscerating all the policies put in place by Obama to support um, the green new, the um, the decarb decarbonization of the U.S., like the like the clean power plan and other policies. So quite so so it framed up that in the U.S. international context, and then it really um, laid out um, five goals. Um, and they're, they've been expressed a number of different ways, but in brief, their um, emissions goals, sort of zero emissions from various sectors, energy, buildings, um, and a fair and just transition for workers affected by um, climate change transitions. Um, a jobs program assuring good jobs and high wages. Um, an infrastructure program that includes investment in infrastructure and in, in, in industrial capacity to support the Green New Deal. Um, environmental and resilience investments that that includes pollution, hardening of infrastructure, um, um, adaptation um, investments, and, and also justice and equity that really is focused on um, redressing certain uh, wrongs that were um, have been or were um, implemented on disadvantaged groups. And those five goals get implemented through projects. Um, um, in areas of infrastructure, energy, clean manufacturing, um, clean sustainable ag, buildings, clean transport, ecosystem restoration, hazardous waste cleanup, and um, international um, sort of Green New Deal export programs. Um, so the underlying piece, I'm, I'm going to put on one, one more piece and we'll go to the, the background. Um, the underlying um, piece of this is, that's been controversial but important, is the, the social contract that is embedded in the Green New Deal. And that's really the idea that um, the Green New Deal should expand access to the full promise of America for, for generations. That's a quote from the think tank that supports the Green New Deal called the New Consensus, which IOC is also involved in. So that social contract includes a more inclusive process in making decisions. It includes um, a more inclusive process in allocating capital to decisions, to investments. Um, it includes um, investments in education for all. It includes in direct investments um, in uh, communities around the country, uh, both rural and urban. It includes jo jobs guarantee, which is something which is um, you know, not expected in, a, in a, an environmental program. It includes support of union um, unionization, workers' right to organize, um, investments in coal and natural gas communities impacted by the loss of these assets. And it includes um, what some have called, including um, Michael um, Lebrecht of Bloomberg Energy Finance, uh, some Trumpian pieces, which are trade policy, like border adjustments to um, increase the cost of, of goods which are imported that are not subject to carbon, um, the carbon, um, you know, the carbon regulation. So there's some interesting populist elements. There's elements that are socialist elements. There's elements that relate to um, investment in finance. So it's a very, it's a very mixed um, uh, type of program. So we'll come back to the policy further on. Let me go to the next slide very briefly for um, for our European colleagues on background. So what is the New Deal? It has a very specific historical and cultural reference in um, the United States, and it relates to um, the program. Um, for uh, relief that came out of the Great Depression in the 1930s. The people, you, the people you see on your screen essentially is the man in the middle is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and around him are various um, cabinet members and others who implemented the first New Deal in 1933. So the New Deal essentially is a package of reforms to stimulate the U.S. economy and create employment and fight against deflation that was implemented by FDR, as he's known, from 1933 to 1936. It essentially had public works um, programs, which includes guaranteed jobs for job programs, that financial reforms that really addressed um, some of the 
like excesses of the of the 1920s, um, and add regulation um, also of banks and and um, the workplace and labor. So some of the some of the minimum wage came out of um, the New Deal. Um, it had some, and the first really the social the social safety net, social security, which is the U.S. Um, program which guarantees income um, and, and old age and for dis disabled folks came out of the um, the New Deal. Now, now this had a it was a very um, comprehensive program. Um, it really kind of um, ended with the war mobilization. Um, and I want to just and actually what's interesting about the Green New Deal, just, just I didn't mention this earlier, is that they invoke the New Deal in the name, but the the but the um, the actual what they're actually calling for in terms of um, how to mobilize against the climate crisis is a World War II like economy wide mobilization, mobilizing all the industrial resources and human resources of the country towards climate change, and so they're actually blending these two sort of golden eras in the U.S. from our perspective and the sort of like the historical sort of gloss is oh the world the, the the New Deal really helped the U.S. pull itself out of the Great Depression and then the World War II you know mobilized resources in the way where created our prosperity so it's, it's really drawing on these these very strong images to um to bring this to the current time so what's the legacy of the New Deal well some of these programs still exist many of them have been discontinued but um, the legacy of Social Security still exists. The Securities, Securities and Exchange Commission, which is the securities regulator in the U.S., of course, still exists. Crop insurance, depository insurance for banks, um, the Federal Housing Administration, all these things came out of the New Deal. Um, politically, the Democratic Party shifted, shifted the politics, and they ended up winning um, seven of the nine presidencies between 1933 and 1969 based on this very popular program before the ultimate pushback we've seen in the last 50 years. So um, I think I should probably stop there, um, Matthias, um, and, and let um, Quentin continue on his, his introduction. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much, Doug. That was uh, excellent. Uh, thanks for also giving us the historical background and reference. And, um, and my understanding would be it's, you know, it's a positive image because of the, the golden era in the sense of an economic boom that resulted from these programs, but also they're, they're both evoking the underlying crisis that is, a, is the driver for such dramatic action to be taken. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. But I, just, I will say, though, that um, the New Deal is heavily contested. I mean, to this day, um, conservatives think it was a massive mistake and going down the wrong path. And, there's efforts to dismantle even like social security because of this, the thought that it was really not something which was an, an American style program. So a certain part of the country thinks it's this great period. Another part of the country thinks it's sort of like part of the decline and fall of the American empire. So it's definitely contested vision right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So it's not necessarily a positive image for everybody. Uh, that, that connects me to, to just a quick follow-up. You've already spoken to the fact that there, just a few days ago, there was the uh, an unveiling of a concept to try and, and become more specific. But you know that's that's happening uh, in the context also, of course, of the the Democratic primaries um, um, in the the run up to next year's November presidential elections in in the U.S. Can you just uh, add a few words as to how after the resolution was. A passed and then you know not passed in in the Senate. How how what role does the Green New Deal play in the Democratic primaries? It's uh, interestingly um, it plays in a, it's played some role. I, I don't think it's I mean there's been an impact in all the can, all the major candidates that are still in the game have endorsed the Green the Green New Deal. Um, there's a ranking of them um, by these. This think tank, another another think tank called Data for Progress, which is also one of the main think tanks supporting this um, effort for AOC, and they've ranked. Um, I'll just give you the quick rankings of the major candidates. So Bernie Sanders basically said, "I'm going to do the Green New Deal." So you guys, he's the highest ranking. Behind him is there's somebody named. This is an interesting point. 
Um, Jay, no one's ever heard of this person, even in the U.S. for the most part. Governor Jay Inslee, who was a governor from Washington State, who since dropped out, put together a comprehensive climate program and the centerpiece of his campaign, and he dropped out. So <laughs> there's, it's, you know, on one hand, there's there's some momentum. On the other hand, you can't run your campaign only on green issues. Um, the next person in line, again, is Cory Booker, who is sort of a second-tier candidate, a senator. Um, and if you go down the list, um, uh, Joe Biden, who probably many of your audience knows as the former vice president, he's actually down at number nine in his ranking of, of the ranking of how people have, have, have chosen to implement stated portions of the Green New Deal. So it's definitely shaped, you know, all shaped the shape the um, the primaries and, and the climate policy of the candidates. Um, I don't think it's been something which has had get, has gotten much discussion in the debates as a big issue as compared to health care. Um, or you know, or President Trump, as a, or generally, or um, um, I mean, the main thing is the Medicare for all, not the Green New Deal. No, excellent. Thank you so much for that, uh, and we'll come back to the Green New Deal in a second. But indeed, uh, uh, you know, now switch over to the Brussels perspective. Interesting, uh, all kinds of connections that one can draw from from what Doug just said. You know, there's also the um, uh, a presidential election involved in the rise of the uh, the um, the concept on the EU side, but the, here it's uh, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, uh, former uh, Defense Minister of, uh, of Germany, who is uh, um, uh, going to take office in just a few uh, days' time. In fact, and um, uh, Quentin kindly you know, give us a similar background uh, on the EU side and, and try where you can to, to draw out uh, the, and, and unpack a little bit the, the differences in the specific EU context here. What is, what is the, it's not the EU Green New Deal because we of course don't have that historic reference, but it's called the European Green Deal. What is your understanding of what that concept is meant to mean? Thanks. So thanks, Matthias. I'm, I'm just going to um, focus on, on the origins, where it comes from and what it's supposed to do, as well as draw parallels with, with the US and how it's, it's quite different in many ways. And I think that's what makes it interesting because they have the same reference. So the, the first thing to notice is the European Green Deal, the idea of a Green Deal for Europe, it, it's nothing new, really. It was already in the political campaign in the 2014 European elections. That was the platform on which the Greens in the European Parliament ran. So this idea of a Green Deal was already there. It just never caught up. When it really caught up was in May this year. So in May this year, the, 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 the new parliament following these elections and the new commission that draws the legitimacy from the parliament put forward the concept of the European Green Deal. The, the main reason for it being that most political parties went on a platform that was focused on climate-friendly policy. That, that the moment when climate policy really wasn't that divisive anymore, especially in Western Europe, th there was a consensus that we needed to do more. And that was very politically silent. So I think that's the main difference between, between the US and the EU already is in the US, it sounds like it's a very politically colored concept. While, while in Europe is much more consensual, I would say, it's, you do have kind of a coalition commission, which is the, 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 the executive body of the EU, that put it front and center and everybody agrees to it. Nobody's really objecting against it. So um, to, to highlight why it came to life in May 2019 and, and not before, I think it's because we in Europe are faced with, with three major constraints that, that I'm trying to highlight in the next slide. The, the, the first constraint is that 92% of the Europeans, and that's data from the European Commission, 92% of the Europeans support climate neutrality by 2050. 92%, it's, it's quite rare to have such a consensus. You might argue that not everybody understands what it means and what it entails, but they have the right to abstain and not answer. They decided to, um, to answer, and 92% of Europeans support the EU going for climate neutrality by 2050, which, which really shows that it's, it's, it's deep in the population, that desire is there, the political will is there. You, you needed to translate that into politics. The second element is the, 
while there seems to be a consensus of we need to do more about climate, once you go down into measures, you realize that we're not one Europe. We have different Europe's cohabiting, and you need to bridge them and to bring them together. And that's what I'm trying to share with the blue and the orange dots. It's it's the same study. They ask, so what should be the priority number one in European energy policy? In the blue dots, you see the people, the countries, for which investing in clean technologies is the priority number one. It's mostly Western and Nordic country. If you look in the orange dots, in the orange charts, it's mostly Eastern and Southern countries. And the answer was, we need to keep the price as low as possible. So you might argue that you, can't, you can do one and the other, that the two are not mutually exclusive, but the gut feeling is that one. And you clearly see a divide there that we need to bridge to be able to continue working on it because otherwise you will not be able to do it. So that's one. That's why the European Green Deal came to life is because we needed something that would bridge these different and competing priorities to under one roof. And, and the last element I wanted to mention is, is there is a live debate at the moment on European infrastructure. What kind of infrastructure do we need in Europe, especially with, for the energy system moving forward, in particular the role of gas, which is a very, very lively debate here in Europe. And the European Green Deal, in a way, is supposed to give answers to these difficult questions because we are one investment cycle away from 2050. So if what you invest today is basically going to lock you in in 2050, and if you're going to go for climate neutrality, you better act now. You cannot afford to lose time. Basically. So it's, it's against the background that the European Green Deal came to life. And, and the second difference with, with the US version of it is nobody, you know, we, nobody fall off their chair when they heard about the European Green Deal. It's, it's not polarizing. It also means it's not really exciting at the moment. It, it just feels like business as usual in a way. While, while I think in the US, it's a very, it, it's something that you want to have a rally about. I've, I haven't seen a rally in Europe about the European Green Deal yet. That might change, but not yet. So there is, a, there is something about the political significance of the terms and what you put behind it. Because in Europe, the European Green Deal is what is defended by the establishment. It's mainstream political currency. It's not something that, that it's not an opposition thing that you run against a government. It really is mainstream. So it's all about the political significance of what it means. So now if we go onto, onto the main slide, onto the next slide, I, what I want to show is basically the European Green Deal is a natural step-wide evolution that we've already witnessed in the past. It started, European climate policy started with the carbon market at its heart and national targets by 2020. And then moving towards 2030, we decided, oh, actually the energy union is the concept that we're going to be using. We're going to put climate and energy closer together and we call that the energy union. And now when we look into 2050, we realize we actually need to go even broader than that. And that's when the European Green Deal comes in. It's the moment when you, you take these different separate policies and you try and bring them in into one roof. And that's where the European Green Deal is. It's the medium through which you're supposed to deliver climate neutrality by 2050. The way the commission, the executive speaks about it at the moment, it is not a major revolution. It is a natural evolution of we're going to bring different policy fields together and we're going to try and make them work better together. But that ends there in a way. It doesn't really go further than that as far as I can tell. And that is a major challenge for the European Green Deal. Because under the Energy Union, you, you had the Energy Union on the one hand, but you also made massive improvements in terms of sustainable finance. The EU now has or will have in a couple of weeks the most advanced sustainable finance framework, policy framework in the world. But it, it kind of sits over there on the side and then you have the climate and energy policies on the other side. And I don't know how they relate to each other really well. And I think that's where the European Green Deal needs to answer. That's where we need to provide answers. Is we're gonna bring these the different things together and we're going to try and make it work better than what they currently work. 
the last thing I want to mention in, in this introduction is about when we talk about the European Green Deal, it's also a way for the European Commission to, to try and go into areas where they try and do different things. The main areas that are associated with the European Green Deal at the moment is about trade, industry and competition policies. This is through the European Green Deal that you can start talking about these things. The EU has a new EU industrial strategy every two years. The idea is because now we have this European Green Deal, hopefully the 2020 version of it might be actually different and, and might do trigger change in the real economy. And the same thing goes for, for trade. We, we, we touched upon it earlier, but the question of the carbon adjustment tax, it's something that is widely discussed in Brussels people being pro and against, but that's also something that comes within this framework of the European Green Deal of we need external policies and internal policies to be able to do it. Mm. The, the last parallel I would draw with the US version of it is the social aspect to it. So we, we, we're not using the European Green Deal to, to secure a minimum wage or, or to secure in a way, to secure decent jobs, yes, but, but also because it's different, because the EU has limited competence in terms of social policies that largely remains in member states' hands. What the emphasis is on is a just transition for workers. So you're going to have to phase out coal. That's going to happen quite quickly. You're going to have to massively restructure your economy to reach net zero emissions as soon as possible and by 2050 at the latest, and that's going to have an impact on people. And it's not about providing them with a minimum wage because the EU has no right to do it, but it's about making sure that there are tools at EU level to go along with this transition, to cushion the transition, to reskill workers as we go along. The, the human dimension is an important dimension into this. And I think that's a very strong parallel between the EU and the US, but the EU also have a much more developed tradition of social security, of minimum wage in many European countries. So the, in a way, we, 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 we have a different background. It's not, it's not as of hell in the US where you do have to have in certain states some of the fundamentals right before moving to something else. Right. So I think I'm going to stop here, try to highlight some areas of contrast. Excellent. Thank you so much, Quentin. A quick follow-up there to, uh, you know, especially specifically that last part. So there, I think there were a couple of points where, um, from what you're explaining about the way that the EU is is viewing and and defining the concept, there are similar elements that that ring, you know, familiar from the US perspective. The the trade dimension actually, you know, connects to the the Trumpian pieces that Doug mentioned as well, including with water. Um, uh, uh, adjustments um, for carbon reasons, carbon pricing reasons, but now on, on the, the social dimension. Uh, so, you know, just transition or, or transitioning workers from sectors, economic sectors, individual industries that are, are, are having to change because they are heavy emissions um, and, and cannot really be sustained in the same format in a climate neutral world. That that seems to me something that, that could happen, you know, in a variety of EU member states. Um, and at the same time, you you were showing us at the beginning how there are differences in terms of priorities, cost v uh, renewables, cost of energy uh, between member states that seem to be slightly correlated to overall levels of economic prosperity. So, is there also a social and a, basically a deal? element here uh, in terms of exchange or you know greater solidarity or social uh, coherence between eu member states yes that's that's at the core of the european green deal what it is trying to do is also to bring people along because it's fundamentally a political project it's a project that emerged from the elections that's a project that we're going to need to bring the people along if we want to have the transition we want to have. I think the EU is still trying to figure out what exactly is the shape of its intervention in this regard. So there will be a just transition fund that will be put forward by the European Commission very soon um, and in a couple of weeks by mid-December. But it's going to be more than money and it's going to be more than public money. 
I, I think one of the things that, that Doug mentioned was, uh, was very helpful was the idea of a social contract of we need to rethink what is the role of the state, what is the role of the private company, and what is the role of the citizen while we decarbonize the economy. And because we still were functioning on the old social model, we, we need to transition to a new one because we need to rethink what is the relationship between these different elements. So if, if I want to use grand words, I would say the European Green Deal needs to be the new EU social contract. It's, it's, it's the moment when the EU, as a political project, establishes its authority with the citizens directly. The EU is the one that is going to transform our economies, the member states' economies, towards in a climate neutral world. And mm -hmm. it's going to defend our jobs and we're going to have, we're going to be better off at the end of the day. But it's the EU that's going to help us delivering that. And if the EU does that, we really had changed some of the things that we heard about the EU and the, the level of skepticism that can exist in some member states. No. Thank you so much. So, you know, with that word, if you're specifically saying this is also a social contract from the EU, I think we are actually much more on par in terms of the concepts and how they could be used on both sides of the Atlantic than I had even anticipated. Um, uh, we, we've, uh, we've taken a little bit longer than anticipated getting these backgrounds in, but I think the fact that uh, our viewers are also a little shy with questions is showing that uh, that you are speaking to uh, a general interest that people want to uh, listen to. So let us uh, um, very quickly segue into uh, you know, expanding on this issue of, of money and payments and investments. And Doug, you mentioned uh, you know, the word investment uh, you know, a couple of times in terms of the contents of the, the Green New Deal. So uh, you know, I know this is also an area where you know, you, you, that you specialize in. Why, um, and so you know, how do you envisage these specific policy initiatives to be looking like, um, uh, you know, that, that such as the one that was just re revealed or maybe, you know, for other sectors, um, how would the, the financing work for something as ambitious as, you know, essentially transforming, you know, not just economic sectors, but also, you know, social structures to some extent over very short periods of time? That's the that's the uh, uh, ten trillion dollar question. <laughs> well, I think um, do we want to go to what they what they've proposed so far concretely. So okay, so before I get to the overall picture, so as I mentioned earlier, the Green New Deal so far, um, you know, was not designed as being a legislative program, and that. Um, that's being implemented um, piecemeal. Um, the background in the U.S. context is that, you know, um, it, it would be very, very hard to get any legislation um, through Congress in its current, comp current or expected composition. That Green New Deal, because if you realize we're undergoing a massive um, rollback of um, climate policy, such as it existed prior to um, President Trump right now. And since the Republicans control the presidency, um, one house of Congress, and um, you know, an increasing portion of the federal judiciary, it'll be very hard to get these kind of policies through unless there's a change um, in the executive um, and legislative, and, and, and in the Senate, and and also that that the Democrats may hold on to their dominance in the House of Representatives. So, what's been proposed. Um, as the first plank by AOC and, and Bernie Sanders is what's called the Green New Deal um, for public uh, for public housing act it was introduced last week and essentially it's a hundred billion um, over a decade and the idea is to um, essentially uh, modernize retrofit and make net zero one million public housing units um, over a decade to make them energy and to make public housing energy independent over a decade. Um, and, uh, and this is at this point to be mainly achieved through um, grant programs. Um, now, the, the grants, of course, I think will be leveraged by private finance, but the, um, given that the, the public housing stock is uh, not an area where um, there's a lot of commercial private investment, um, they'll need to have some subsidies to make this happen, given, particularly given the cost 
of um, you know of these technologies and the cost of uh, you know subsidized cost of public housing. Um, interestingly, in this proposal, um, they, the the main driver appears to be uh, jobs. The the numbers they put out on jobs um, was quite enormous. They're saying 240,000 jobs per year could be created by this initiative. Um, and I think this is probably the main reason why they led with it because these aren't jobs can be offshoot of construction jobs. These are jobs which are going to build a supply chain to create these kinds of um, investments. This is going to drive certain technologies. Yes, those could be imported, but but generally speaking, this seems to touch a lot of the goals of the Green New Deal. It's also something which I think could be largely controlled by the executive branch um, uh, once it was implemented. Um, so it's something which would also allow the resources to be spread all over the country, particularly in areas where there's um, you know a lot of poverty in the U.S. Another thing that was interesting about it is that there is uh, well, I hadn't been aware of this, but there's been this um, a ban on increasing the number of public housing units um, by law. So this would actually roll back that law because again, the whole idea of you know public ha subsidized housing and um, these social protections, um, you know, goes against the grain of a certain trend in the American, certain not trend, a certain tendency in the American idea, which is really limited government. Um, lack of subsidization, which is not present in the EU. Um, so, um, and this would be, and this would be, in this particular case, this would be financed by um, the suggestion is among the proposers uh, by reversing um, the 2017 uh, federal tax cuts, which primarily benefited the wealthy and corporations. So, the the general, the, the larger idea about how do you pay for it is is the biggest is the big idea um, sort of in the, in the Green New Deal that's that's of course being um, is very controversial so briefly I'll just say that I, um, the the overall um, framework of uh, federal spending um, is sort of boundaried by the idea that um, very strong idea in, in both some of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party that you should not incur you should have a balanced budget but you shouldn't incur um, um, uh, large, large deficits unless there's some sort of countercyclical stimulus that's needed. Um, on the, and also on the side of the sort of the um, macro side, that um, the numbers which are are are, are showing on, on unemployment in the economy um, are very low. Um, they're disputed these numbers as to whether they really reflect the true level of um, unemployment or the level that um, people who don't want people who feel like have left the job, have left the workforce. But the the hunting inspector is inflation. If the government puts in a giant program um, and, the, and the economy is already at the point where it can absorb that investment, it's going to cause inflation. Um, now, of course, the larger discussion, which I think was very interesting, um, behind the think tanks that are involved in the Green New Deal, I think, and also I'm not sure about Europe, but certainly this is a European discussion, is sort of the mystery of, um, you know, lack of inflation in many, in Japan and the negative interest rates in Europe and all these things. So um, the idea is mo modern monetary theory is that we've somehow tamed inflation and that large public spending programs don't have, don't run the risk of inflation if they're done in parts of the economy that um, you know can absorb that investment, and notably infrastructure in the U.S. has been is, there's all these massive numbers about how underinvested we are in infrastructure, even without taking into account climate change. <laughs> I mean, the U.S. And, and this is maybe different than Europe in the sense that um, a lot of the so how would we how do we typically finance infrastructure? And I'm going to tip it, I'm going to kind of wrap this up this piece. We finance it through um, for a variety of means, most things like the energy sector is financed largely um, by utilities, um, by who, of course, charge ratepayers, people buy electricity to build those the electrical systems. Um, the rest of infrastructure, like water, like roads, other than highways, infra highways, and, and, and um, inter 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 interstate roads. 
um, like um, you know any kind of ports or airports or all these things. A lot of those are financed by lo local governments or state governments, not the federal government. Large projects like large airports, interstates, um, you know, uh, 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 rail systems have a big federal component, but um, we have something called municipal bonds, which are bonds that are issued by um, local government, state government entities, and that and that are that are tax that are tax free at the federal level. Those really fund infrastructure. So any sort of green new deal plan would have to try to build on those existing mechanisms which the U.S. already uses. Now there are some things that are being proposed that we're a part of a national climate bank proposal, which is which is one of the Green New Deal sponsors, uh, Senator Markey, is proposing this national climate bank, which would be akin to say a European investment bank, because we don't have those public investment vehicles really in the U.S. I do work with green banks, which are these public banks that have been formed at the state level, which are an increasing um, feature of the landscape and actually mentioned, public banks are mentioned in the Green New Deal program. But that whole public finance program of having an active public banking sector, we don't really, we don't have that in the U.S. Um, what we do have is um, using things like the tax system um, tax the, the the solar energy wind energy system has been really funded by tax credits, um, depreciation tax benefits, and sort of state policies. Um, so how the Green New Deal would roll out exactly um, is under it, that's the main question. Can we do it through issuing federal bonds? Can we do it through through reversing tax taxes through carbon taxes? This is the big issue. The last thing I'll say is that if you, I did uh, did review again the the recent work or earlier this year work by um, by Bloomberg New Energy Finance, who basically said the one trillion dollar estimate for capital investment, which the new Green New Deal sponsors put out, is what he thinks he thinks is accurate. But that does not include any of the jobs guarantee, the health care costs, the other social contract programs, which um, which are mentioned as part of a critical part of the Green New Deal and part of the part of its political viability. Um, so I think the idea I think behind all of this is that we can, the government can spend more, can direct, it, can have an industrial policy at kind of what Quentin was saying. We need an industrial policy, which we don't have right now in the U.S. really, um, that is based on green, that is directed by the government, that leverages private capital, um, and that um, has some combination of, of taxes. Um, and 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 sort of um, uh, expansionary monetary policy that that drives this 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 program and that it, the growth that that is entailed by this program will more than pay for the the, the short term costs. Thank okay. you. Um, thank you for also relating it to you know the the way that things may be slightly different in terms of the the financing landscape um, uh, in the EU. We we have a few questions, but I'm I'm and we're uh, we're close to the end of our time. What I would suggest to do is. Um, uh, Quentin, that you briefly, you know, also speak to the the financial dimension and and the the follow up of the specification of what the concept is from the EU side, but you know, in the in the briefest possible terms, and then we take a couple of the questions that we've gotten as something that I read to you, and do you get then a chance to still respond to as we're closing the the webinar? I hope that's okay with you, Quentin, please. Yep, that works. So um, with, with, with the three minutes I have, I'm, I'm going to make three remarks. The, the first one is the, this idea of having macroeconomic changes is also something that, that has and is happening in the EU right now. We saw that with the European Investment Bank decided not to invest in fossil fuel anymore. There are nuances to that, but that's the headline message. You also had the head of the European Central Bank, the monetary pillar of the EU, also signaling that there needs to be more green issues be taken into account. The, the interesting fact that that happens outside of the European Green Deal framework. Right. They, they, they are there, but they, they don't relate, they're not connected to what the EU, what the Commission means by the European Green Deal. Because what the Commission means by the European Green Deal, that's my second point, and that's the slide, is this. It's a legislative agenda. 
these are all individual policies under legislation or not that will happen in the next five years and on which the Commission has slapped the label European Green Deal. This is the European Green Deal that goes in the European Commission as far as we know. I think the understanding of what it is will evolve in the coming weeks when we have the strategy in our hands, but at the moment, it's a label you put on policy. The third element on the next slide is, is about, we think it needs to be something different. You probably can't read this, but it needs to be something different. We think the European Green Deal has to address five different challenges at the same time. And it can do it, but we need to be clever about the policies that we will put in place they're not individual policies, they need to be seen in conjunction with others. If you do an industrial strategy, you need to think about trade, you need to think about finance. Getting one thing right is not good enough anymore. You need to get the whole thing right and you need to take a holistic whole of government approach to it. So we think you need to have to tackle five different challenges. At the end of slides, I won't expand on it for the sake of time, but they're going to be included in the paper we're going to release in December. Excellent. So, you know, there are then more, there's the more than one paper um, on the European Green Deal, deal to be read, uh, you know, in Brussels in December, both when, uh, in fact, the European Commission, as indeed, if you could just show that slide, um, has uh, supposedly um, coming out with a, a paper here. And I, I couldn't help but, um, uh, with Quentin's permission, uh, quote him uh, from a tweet uh, of only a few weeks ago. Um, uh, where he was underlying the point that he was just trying to make on, you know, what the, um, the the Commission's understanding of the Green New Deal is in terms of a set of policy initiatives and what what he thinks that it should be. That there is still work that needs doing on, you know, the the what uh, what is the glue, what's the political uh, glue that actually um, you know starts creating the visionary element uh, um, of this and actually allows for political will to be generated for a lot of this to come together. Um, I, I know that the political will question is also going to be the big one in the, in the U.S. as we see, you know, how the the concept will be applied in after the Democratic primaries, the actual presidential race, what role it might play there, and then what could happen with it after the presidential election. Um, uh, we do not get to expand on these points right now. Um, and could I have the cover slide, please? Um, but I'm, I'm going to read you uh, two or three uh, questions. And as closing statements, you can get, still get to very briefly to some of them. One uh, specifically from uh, a viewer is, uh, what in your role, uh, what in your view is, is the role potentially of, of actors operating transnationally or in both on both sides of the Atlantic? In, in bridging, uh, you know, creating a link between a, a Green New Deal on the US side and, and a European Green Deal. Um, uh, then um, uh, question whether one of the differences between the US and the EU perspective isn't that the, the US perspective is actually one that's, you know, uh, trying to break and, and propose, put forward a, a slightly different uh, economic model, whereas in fact what, what's happening in the EU is mainstream because it's also part of a, you know, a, a mainstream e economic approach. Um, and then uh, specifically, I don't, do not know, um, uh, I can't tell whether you can speak to that, but there is a European Green Deal concept um, developed by the UK Labour Party and one launched by an organization called DM25. So, you know, if you have any sense of how what they proposed uh, you know, compares with uh, the EU, that would be great. And, and thank you for all the other questions and I'll we will pass them on to our experts um, uh, after the webinar. So, uh, Doug, maybe you want to have a, a first crack and then uh, we'll hand it over to Quentin. Sure, very briefly, um, what do I, I think the links, I think these activists are already co collaborating um, at the activist level. I think the whole idea of the Green Deal, the Green New Deal, is, it's a signal to each side. Um, I think as a, as a transnational actor, the only one that I that comes to mind as being effective in this would be the youth movement, which is, I mean, I mean Greta um, on the European side, which is Greta has gone global, and of course um, the Sunrise movement is is an AOC millennial sort of back movement is what's most active here. Um, I think those would be the, the main players in the, in the politics. Um, I think also the the MMT, the Modern Monetary Theory scholars, are already collaborating. The central banks are actually collaborating. So as Kontan said, I think that it's a lot of this can ha is happening not necessarily strictly under the confines of the Green New Deal, but it actually, these things 
are, 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 are necessary building blocks for the Green New Deal to actually have any content and efficacy. Um, the second question, I didn't really understand it. it the, the U.S. Yes, the U.S. requires a different um, model of the economy. Well, how would you just, yeah. Um, so uh, my understanding was basically the proposal in the U.S. is is yeah. is, is essentially challenging, indeed, uh, an economic model. And as you were pointing out, there's some there's more ideological differences and takes on on the concept. So the question was, isn't that one of those ways in which the the two concepts on both sides of the Atlantic differ? That one is more a challenge to a specific way of thinking yeah. about how the op the economy should be run. I would say definitely yes, but I think it's also we shouldn't underestimate the fact that it's also a a um, a marker to the to the far left in an attempt to move the whole system to the left. It will never end up to be um, what it's designed it's written to be in the in a Green New Deal proposal. It's an attempt to move the conversation. So I think ultimately. Um, I think even the even the organizers realize that they won't end up getting the whole package. It'll be some it'll be some mix of of what of what the possible is. So it's an attempt to move the whole system, but I don't think that um I mean I would say I would just say that Contact can say, but I think the idea that there should be a an EU social con contract is a pretty radical idea, as far as I understand. I mean, especially in all, or even having fiscal spending or fiscal policy even be something which is a part of what the EU is influencing. So I think they're both sort of radical programs, but in different ways at different scales. So, uh, Quentin, your take. Thank you very much Dirk, for answering these questions. So, um, I'm, I want to come back to on, on the first question first on on the role of transnational actors. I think we what we saw in in transatlantic relation recently is also the fact that government to government or, or, or political entity to political entity can be difficult. One, if you do city to city network or if you do state to state, you do have a very different kind of conversation. And I think we're going to need to have that conversation more and more, especially in the US, because there is such a big difference between the federal government and what's happening in the states. You, we, we're going to have to basically have that discussion at different levels. Also, because the main issue between the US and the EU at the moment is a question of trade and soybeans in particular. And I think we're going to need to have more and more of these conversations because if the political leaders on both sides of the Atlantic are going through this threatening, answering, threatening, answering kind of mode, at some point there's going to need to have a discussion at a different level of governance that just take the heat out of that discussion. And basically show that what we really need in both ends of the Atlantic is might not be a border tax adjustment, but it might just be a decarbonization of the economy as soon as we can, and then bringing the others on board. So it's shifting the conversation, and that's something that I think in both ends of the Atlantic, that's something that we can do. On, on, on the last two questions, I think they're really related, so I'm just going to address them in once. The person asking the question is absolutely right. There are alternative proposals to the European Green Deal out there. Some of them coming from the from from the left or the far left from the M25, but you also have other concepts, other papers, other think tanks putting meaning behind what the European Green Deal is. What I presented today is how it has been the narrative has been captured by the establishment and presented. But you do have other organizations trying to put different meanings to, behind it. And as long as the commission is vague at best about what it means, you're gonna have this dichotomy. The, it remains a political project and people will have different interpretation on it and it's a good thing. We, can, we need to have a conversation about what it means. We need to have a conversation about the tools and the instruments. What I presented was the official commission way of thinking about it, but you do have alternatives out there that will enrich the debate because they provide alternative views of what it is and what it can do. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kantan. I think that uh, you know uh, makes for a good rounding off uh, um, a final uh, statement as well to the topic, which uh, you know will, in terms of political developments, will be one to watch not over the, just the next uh, few weeks, but uh, but month. And what it, it goes to show is that you know one thing that um, the concept can do on both sides is actually stimulate debate, put a bold vision out there. Um, and it basically remains to be seen what the, the political discourse and, and respective political systems will allow in terms of engagement and, 
an actual policy outcome as a result in the outcome. I'm, I want to thank um, very much as well for uh, um, all of those that have been working on maybe recording, and a thanks to our funders and partners, and of course to the two of you for making the time and, and sharing your expertise and your insights with us today. I much appreciate it. Thank you for organizing, Matthias. That was a really good discussion. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, kindly, if you are interested, um, uh, do watch uh, a couple of the other recordings and webinars online at energyfuturex.org or on the ecologic.eu website. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.